The NEMA chief gives an update on Ragged Island. The chairman of the Shantytown Action Task Force responds to those threats from Fred Smith, QC. News is brought to you by Alive. In best. Welcome to our news and thanks for joining us. I'm Kyle Joaquin. The government has acquired the Grand Lucayne Resort on Grand Bahama, according to Hutchison Lucayne Limited. Employees were notified of the sale yesterday by executives. The Bahamas government is now considered responsible for their employment, but just how secure are their jobs? According to the Prime Minister's press secretary, they have nothing to worry about. Unless the letter says y'all got to leave because somebody else bought the property, the situation as it is will remain. In a letter dated September 10th, 2018, Hutchison Lucaya Limited notified its more than 400 hotel employees. We hereby confirm the Grand Lucayan Hotel has been purchased by Lucayan Renewal Holdings Limited, which is owned by the government of the Bahamas. The sale becomes effective September 11th, 2018. It continued, as a result of the sale, there will be no change in the terms and conditions of your employment as Lucayan Renewal Holdings Limited has agreed to continue the employment of all staff. Well, the Prime Minister's press secretary today assuring those employees their jobs are secure. And it's a sentiment shared by attorney representing the Commonwealth Union of Hotel Services and Allied Workers, Pleasant Bridgewater. She said the union wasn't surprised at all about the sale and that government kept them aware of all that was going on. The only ones who didn't know about everything, she says, were the Bahamian public. We did speak with, we had a conference with the minister responsible for the negotiations. We also had Mr. Crazy, minister Crazy Thompson. And he assured us that the employee's position was secure in terms of there being continuation of employment, continuous employment, also the continuation and continuous benefits that they were not losing anything, and that the government was assuming responsibility and liability going forward as of today's date. The government agreed to purchase the resort for the full asking price of $65 million. Our news reached out to Michael Scott, who is the chairman of the Special Purpose Vehicle Board, which is seeking a buyer for the resort. He offered no comment on the matter. When government signed a sales agreement with Hutchison Wampoa last month, it made a down payment of $10 million. Now, there is still no word on how government executed the sale, as according to Scott, the Minutes administration was required to issue a guarantee under the agreement of sale, which would have to be done through a resolution in the House of Assembly. The House is currently on break and will not meet until September 19th. Until then, the attorney of the union representing the employees at the center of this ordeal says they're all good. All of the employees would remain employed, subject, of course, to their choice to sever the relationship. And once the or anyone deciding that they wanted to sever the relationship, meaning to retire or to, to, to leave the company, they would be paid their severance package in accordance with the law or any agreements that would have been in place with the hotel and the union. Well, it turns out the National Emergency Management Agency never lifted its uninhabitable status of Ragged Island. That's according to NEMA Director Captain Stephen Russell, who revealed that fact a year and a day after that island was ravaged by Hurricane Irma. But despite that lapse in time, Russell insists officials are doing all they can as fast as they can. Jasmine Brown reports. The NEMA chief revealing today, despite the fact that Ragged Island was ravaged more than a year ago, it is still officially deemed uninhabitable. So until the facilities are in place for your nurse or your doctor to go and stay in, uh, it's difficult for us to, um, to say, um, to, leave, to, to lift the status on, on, on that particular island this time. Okay? I think the um, agencies are racing to see what they can do to restore um, the basic facilities needed. Last year, Hurricane Irma decimated Ragged Island, wiping out government facilities including the police station, school, electrical and water plants, as well as the clinic. Days after its passage, Prime Minister Dr. Hubert Minnis said health and safety conditions rendered the island unlivable. As a result, the government transferred the island's nurse, teacher and officers to work on other islands. Russell says based on that fact alone, the island's uninhabitable status remains. Again, I met with um, some officials from the um, Ragged Island Association, and they have a desire for us to lift the status as non, 
livable or non-inhabitable, okay, that the government placed on it a year ago. And my, 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 my response to them was, um, we cannot, unless the basic infrastructure is in place, key, fish, um, key persons are in place, more so, in fact, when they went there last, they're asking for a, 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 how soon the doctor can come back with a nurse, okay? So in terms of a nurse and a doctor, your police, um, social services, um, school for the kids who are there. Unless those basic institutions are structures in place, um, it's hard for the government to sanction the place livable. Okay? Dr. Minnis also announced the government's intention to transform it into the first fully green island in the region. The Prime Minister explained at the time, renewable energy and smart technology from solar energy and sustainable water purification systems will be utilized for this effort with the help of residents and descendants of the island. However, more than a year later, there has been little improvement there. But Russell says officials are working as quickly as they can, adding that plans have been completed to rebuild the government facilities. I've been in contact with officials from the Ministry of Works. Um, they have should have completed some drawings to replace the school, the police station, the administrator's office, as well as the clinic. Those four structures, plans that have been completed for them, uh, can it just a matter of um, being approved and funds being directed to um, erect these facilities. Hopefully they can get started um, as early as next month. Now, according to Russell, Nima is in the process of assisting 23 families on the island. He said five of those families asked for assistance in the last two weeks. Reporting for our news, I'm Jasmine Brown. Meanwhile, Ragged Island MP Chester Cooper says government has failed to live up to its promises to restore that storm-ravaged community. Jared Hicks has that angle. Despite a $4,000 donation to every household on that island, MP for Ragged Island Chester Cooper says enough still has not been done. Cooper says the nearly $80,000 in aid sent to Ragged Island just a few weeks ago was helpful for some, but didn't assist the most needy on the island because it excluded individuals whose homes were destroyed. People who've lost their entire homes, I understand, uh, weren't considered in this process because they were required to be inspection of the, the worthiness of the, of, the construct, of the construction and the building being, uh, being repaired. On top of the lack of financial support for some, the island has gone a year without a clinic or administrative building. Cooper says they are also waiting for more details from Prime Minister Dr. Hubert Minnis on plans for Ragged Island to be developed as a green island. We don't see the type of commitment by the government uh, to restore the police, the, the nurses, the, the schools and any other public uh, facilities. Uh, the post office, uh, there's no postal service and indeed this green island that the Prime Minister talked about, uh, we heard nothing else since his grand announcement in Parliament. So we'd like to, to really get a report from the government after one year uh, of, of doing very little to restore public services to Ragged Island. We'd like to see a report from the government as to what its, what its plans are uh, and how we will move forward with some specific timelines. Late last year, General Manager for the IDB's Country Department Caribbean Group, Therese Turner-Jones, said it doesn't make sense to rebuild Ragged Island because it would be too costly. As recently as this week, Cooper says individuals outside the country have inquired into the progress on the island. The Prime Minister made some comment about uh, Ragged Island be, being inhabitable. The reality is that uh, this is the home of people who know and love Ragged Island. Uh, they inhabit Ragged Island. They're not going anywhere. This is their home. And I believe this is causing some concern even in the in international community. I received some inquiries yesterday about Ragged Island being inhabitable, uninhabitable. Cooper says the silver lining has been the fairly quick restoration of utilities to the island. However, with powerful storms brewing in the Atlantic Ocean, the obvious concern is that the little progress made on the island could be undone overnight. Reporting for our news, I'm Jared Higgs. All right, thanks, Jared. Well, while the eastern coast of the U.S. braces for Hurricane Florence, local meteorologists say the Bahamas will feel some effect from the dangerous Category 4 storm. Deputy Director in the Department of Meteorology, Basil Dean, revealing today that officials expect sea swells of 18 to 20 feet. The east coast as the system uh, tracks uh, inland. Uh, but as it makes its way towards the Carolinas, we will have some indirect impact uh, from Florence uh, starting tomorrow morning. We anticipate some very large uh, sea swells, uh, which would propagate uh, southward. 
uh, we anticipate uh, wave heights uh, as much as uh, 18, possibly even 20 feet, uh, hitting the coastlines of uh, some of our more easterly islands, uh, namely uh, Abaco uh, to our north, uh, Eleuthera, and uh, Cat Island. Dean says those conditions are expected to impact those islands until Friday, as he specifically warned Eleuther residents to stay away from the glass window bridge. During today's press briefing, NEMA officials gave media a tour of their newest equipment thanks to a $1.8 million grant from Japan. The grant that was signed under the former Christie administration was used to purchase equipment for disaster risk management, disaster response, and disaster restoration. But these are key assets that are part of our logistics program and our response and recovery program. Okay? The freezers can come off and they can, um, like I said, these two trucks, these two um, chassis here, that's the truck, the tractor here, they would normally move them from place to place for us, okay? Again, um, provided by the Japanese government, they have sent somebody to, um, we have trained some 15 young um, Marines and persons from Ministry of Works and other agencies to operate this. In other news, Princess Margaret Hospital's administrator has been placed on administrative leave. According to Health Minister Dr. Dwayne Sands, who, revealed, who also revealed that an investigation is underway at the facility. Jillian Ray reports. Though he offered very few details, Health Minister Dr. Dwayne Sands revealed outside Cabinet today that PMH Administrator Mary Walker has been placed on administrative leave. She's on administrative leave. So it was on a disciplinary suspension? Uh, she's on administrative leave. So it was disciplinary. She's on administrative leave. Walker, a nurse and patient safety and risk manager with over 30 years experience, was named hospital administrator at PMH in May 2013. When pressed by reporters on the reason, Sands would only say that Walker is on leave for two weeks and an investigation is currently underway. Every staff member is due due process. And so uh, if you're on administrative leave, uh, there's obviously uh, a process that is followed so that we adhere to the uh, human resources policies and procedures. And uh, I think that's about as much as I'd like to say about that. When asked whether there are issues at the senior level of the hospital, Sands would only say they are constantly seeking to find the right team for the management of the hospital. I don't want to uh, conflate uh, issues. At the end of the day, uh, what we try to do is make sure that the right persons are in the right place at the right time in order to provide services to the Bahamian public. This revelation comes amid challenges at the public hospital. Sand says a shortage of nurses has forced officials to slash the treatment time allotted to some dialysis patients from three to four hours to now two hours. However, he stressed that these challenges have existed for more than a decade. But we continue to have significant challenges because we don't have enough nursing, because the equipment requires upgrades uh, and all of these things now we're trying to address to figure out what is the appropriate way forward. Despite this, Dr. Sands is optimistic that things will get better. He says a new CAT scan and imaging equipment will be in place by October. The health minister added that they are also working to ensure that nurses feel respected and appreciated. Reporting for our news, I'm Jillian Gray. While the government has halted its shantytown eviction efforts in New Providence, it has continued its work in the family islands. However, this is being met with pushback from attorney Fred Smith, who is threatening to cite the government for contempt of court. With more on this, here's George Bain. According to the chairman of the Shantytown Action Task Force, Dion Folks, he'll be seeking legal guidance from the attorney general before responding to any threats from Fred Smith, QC. On Monday, Smith warned folks who chairs the Shantytown Action Task Force to stop Shantytown eradication plans on the family islands or face being cited for contempt of court. He also called on the government to install utility services in Shantytowns in Abaco. I read Mr. Fred Smith's comments in the dailies this morning. Um, I have to get advice from the Attorney General on exactly um, what are the legal implications of what he said. Um, I prefer not to utter my personal opinion. I have a view on it um, as an attorney, um, but I prefer to wait for the Attorney General to advise us on exactly the position of the government with respect to what Mr. Fred Smith said in the papers this morning. Smith's threats follow comments from folks who has advised that the Abaco Shantytown survey was complete and that the members of staff for the Shantytown Action Task Force were moving on to the next steps to getting those communities eradicated by July 31, 2019. 
Folks said that there are approximately 912 households in six shanty towns throughout Abaco. According to folks, he has met with members of staff and that he is pleased with the progress being made in Abaco. I had a very successful meeting. Um, myself, the permanent secretary, my ministry and others went down to Marsh Harbor on Saturday. And we had a very successful meeting with the Shantytown Action Task Force Committee in Marsh Harbor. Um, they're working very hard. There's some 30 persons, both from the private and government sector, and also from local government. Reporting for our news, I'm Georgie Obey. All right, thanks, Georgie. Still to come, what's happening with the amended Oban Heads of Agreement? Stay tuned to find out.